Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Joe Griffiths. I work for the BRC Global Standards. Um, I've worked for BRC for around six years now, and it's always a real pleasure to be invited to speak at events like this amongst industry. It's really useful. I think last night I learned a lot about you know what people's priorities are and, and, and what people are thinking about when, when they now think about food contact materials. Um, so my job is basically the big blue book that is the packaging standard, but I'm actually going to talk about migration um, today. So it's uh, lovely to be in Switzerland because it's where all the good chocolate is. Um, and funnily enough, chocolate's not a bad place to start because, of course, you know, chocolate's one of those substances that is really good at absorbing all those malodors, you know, petrol fragrances, that kind of thing. So um, it's kind of one of those things that we know chocolate's really good at that. We know that, you know, chocolate companies put their products onto petrol forecourts for a month, and if they survive, if they don't taste of petrol afterwards, then they've got some good packaging going on. What we didn't know was that dry cereals can also pick up, um, dry products can also pick up um, contamination. Dry products can also uh, acquire um, substances that shouldn't be there. Um, and last night, th th when we were in the, um, in the, in the, in the reception, um, it's, it's always these unknown unknowns that come up and, and bite us um, really badly. Now, the Daily Mail, unfortunately, has got a really bad reputation as being a bit of a scaremongering newspaper. Anyone who's British will understand just how scummy uh, the... Uh, sorry, pardon my parlance. How scummy the Daily Mail can be. But then the, da the Telegraph picks it up as well, so we know it's serious because the Telegraph is talking about it. So, uh, Telegraph, very serious newspaper, um, very fact-based, very um, educated people read the Telegraph. I don't. I haven't got a doctorate, so I can't. Um, so cereals then, so yes, dry products, suddenly we're terrified of these mineral oils. Where do they come from? Well, printed inks from newspapers, okay, we worked that out. Um, one scientist comes up with um, a way to find them. Um, unfortunately, the problem with uh, a lot of testing, I think, is that the, the repeatability isn't there and the consensus on testing uh, methodologies isn't there. So I just wanted to run through migration and what it is, because I think it's nice to sort of uh, have a bit of a recap sometimes. So there's actually five different types of migration, um, and the main factors being time and temperature and the molecular size. Um, so time, of course, you need proximity and uh, a length of duration. That's why chocolate bars are on the petrol hall court for a month. Um, temperature, of course, molecules act faster when they're warm. And the molecular size, so anything under 1,000 Daltons typically doesn't uh, migrate. So benzophenone, for example, is, is a very small molecule, so that, that migrates very easily. And then you've got the composition of the food. So like, like we were saying, chocolate is a fatty product. It, it, it acquires odours. Um, but then there's that unknown unknown of those cereals and, and dry products. But also the packaging materials themselves. And it's an interesting point that was brought up about just how many components there are in a piece of packaging. Um, because in theory, there's only four different types of packaging. You've got paper, metal, plastic, and glass. So in theory, you've got a very simple uh, set of packaging materials. Unfortunately, what you do is, you, you know, the water bottles that are here today, you can't transport water without a cap on it, so you have to add a cap. And, of course, the cap won't seal without a compound. Uh, then you've got labels. Okay, not too much of a problem with glass, because it's, it's, it's not going to uh, allow any of those inks through. And so it goes on. And what people don't realise very often is that plastics are so complex that, you know, a very thin plastic uh, substance, a very... You know, in, in the UK, it's typical to get um, a, a thermoformed meat container with a film across the top, and people think, that film, oh, it's just a piece of cellophane. It's probably about at least five layers in that piece of packaging. It, just in that film, it's highly engineered. Coke bottles have got five layers in them because they're co-extruded. So, you know, there's that added complexity. I was saying last night, actually, that glass, in, in theory, is the perfect packaging material. It's inert, it's safe. It's, it's resistant to everything apart from uh, the, odd, the odd acid. Um, but of course, it's really heavy, so as soon as you start to rely on one packaging material, um, you introduce other problems, because once you start transporting it, your costs go up, your petrol use goes up, so you know, there's whole, whole, whole uh, gamuts of, of unintended uh, consequences. So contact migration then, so that's literally um, two materials, so a material such as food. So the example I often give is a hot pizza delivered to, to your home. Um, the grease left on the board, well, grease has migrated from the pizza into the board. So in theory, substances from the board could migrate into the pizza. So that's uh, a very simple way of explaining that. Now, board, generally safe. Board in contact with food is usually virgin board, so don't worry about pizzas. 
So then you've got gas phase migration. So this is where there's an air gap. So this is where, how um, substances migrate from packaging into uh, dry products. So th it goes to actually the, the airspace. And there might be a plastic pouch in there, often, often with cereals, of course, there's a pouch as well. Um, and that plastic pouch is critical in solving um, that specific problem around uh, a, a mineral oil contamination of, of dry products, I think. Um, and then penetration migration. So, um, oh, for example, I suppose it's, it's inks again migrating through a packaging material that's in direct contact with a, with a food product. Um, you've got set-off migration, so when uh, pa printed packaging materials are reeled, um, if it's not dried properly, the inks can set off into the inside, and of course, according to the legislation, you can't put food in contact with printed surfaces. So effectively, you're breaking the legislation, and you're also introducing uh, a source of contamination. And then you've got condensation and distillation, and this is usually associated with packaging materials that are heated, so anything that's microwaved or oven. So if you're using ovenable packaging materials, then this is a, a, a probably more concern than any of the other types. So migration modelling um, is the normal route. Um, the trouble is, and I think we started to hint at it in the last discussion, was that it picks up everything and it assumes the worst case scenario based on you know, the set of data that we have. Um, and it's based on, obviously, scientific law. I'm not a, a strict scientist, so I'm not going to go into that. But we, we sort of know how th these things should act, so therefore we, we can model it. The trouble is, that all that data has to be absolutely right. You have to be, have the courage and convictions that the, the information that comes out of that migration modelling is absolutely accurate. Um, and and it, it absolutely, actually overestimates um, the amount of, of migrants into a food product, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it does potentially give people the impression that packaging isn't as safe as it is. When I tell people I work in packaging, there was recoil in horror because they think of all the, the packaging they have to deal with and the recycling that they have to manage. Um, so it's, it's, it's yet another string to their bow if they can say, well, packaging's dangerous as well, isn't it? Because it, you've got all these chemicals in it that's trying to kill me. Um, I, try not to get into too much of an argument because I do get on a bit of a soapbox and start ranting, so um, I try not to go into that. Um, so migration testing, as you're probably aware, it's all done with simulants. There are certain, set, certain um, things set out in the legislation to dictate how these things are done. I think the problem with, with the mineral oil specifically is that there is no agreed testing methodology to find those and what the acceptable limits might be if we can find those substances in a piece of packaging. Um, or, or, in fact, in the food product rather than the piece of packaging. So the law, of course, we've got the framework regulation, and we've always talked around, uh, or, or already talked around, you know, the principle of the law is to not bring uh, danger to human health, to, to not um, um, change the, the actual um, composition, that's the word I'm looking for, composition of the food so that it's dangerous to anybody. Um, and organoleptic changes as well, and that's the Mars bar and the petrol uh, forecourt uh, principle, or the chocolate bar on, on, the, on the petrol forecourt. So then we've, oh, sorry. then we've got the specific legislation around plastics. Now, of course, there is specific legislation about plastics, but that doesn't mean that everything else isn't covered because it comes under the framework of regulation. So the, the issues with, or potential issues with carton board from the mineral oils would just drop back into the uh, framework leg legislation. I'm not aware if the uh, Commission are working on any more specific legislation for any of the material types, so um, I need to keep an eye out on that. Oh, I've already said that. Um, so this is just sort of how the, the, the legislation is arranged. You can actually remove the green box, because uh, that's, that's actually in, in, in place now, as far as I'm aware. So how does a packaging manufacturer demonstrate that they comply? Well, it's a re legal requirement for the plastics to have a declaration of compliance. Um, and the standard that I, I manage, uh, the, the packaging standard, actually mandates the declaration compliance for all materials. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're using glass or paper or, or whatever. Um, and if you're certificated to the standard as a packaging manufacturer, you have to have de declaration compliance for everything. Um, <clears throat> so often I see in audit reports that you know they say, oh, non-applicable because we don't do plastics. Some of them read the, read the standard and actually that's a non-conformity. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the global standards as well, because I think last night when I was talking to a few people, it was, it was obviously not a huge level of understanding, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the standards. So we've got um, several principles of the standard. People think B 
BRC, British Retail Consortium. It's all British, it's all those British <coughs> retailers telling everybody what to do. I try and emphasise the global uh, nature of, of our name, global standards. Um, we've got 26,000 sites in 134 countries. We're not UK-centric. We deal with the retailers now across the globe, um, in Europe, uh, North America, um, Australasia. Um, we are building and developing relationships with those people. When I talk about retailers, I mean brand owners as well. So not just you know the Walmarts of this world, but also um, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, the people who actually can have a huge impact on, on consumer safety. So we've got six standards. You might be surprised to find we've got six standards. Um, so packaging is uh, the one with the egg box. That's the one I look after. Um, then we've got the food safety standards. That's literally people who uh, manufacture or process any food product. It's post-farm gate. Um, and then we've got storage and distribution, which covers any type of storage and distribution activity. Um, then we've got consumer products. So this is literally people products that people buy. That's actually been split into two different standards now. So we've got personal care and household, which is all the formulated type products, and then general merchandise, which is your hard lines, your televisions, your toasters, that kind of, kind of product. Then we've got agents and brokers. Now, agents and brokers came out of horse meat. Now, I never go to a conference and don't hear the phrase horse meat, so I thought, well, I, I'll mention it this time. Um, so it was a direct result of that, because it was, it was out of the Elliott report, really, that, dictated, that determined that part of the problem in the supply chain was that all these agents and brokers not necessarily being as truthful as they should be. So that's why they, we wrote a standard. And then retail, which is absolutely brand new, only launched, I think, in August. Um, so that's designed for retail operations, so shops, stores, any, anybody who sells food direct to the consumer. So we've really got a standard to, to address every part of the supply chain. Um, packaging and food safety are very manufacturing focused. You have to be making those things in order to use them. Um, and the other one, and consumer products, but the other ones are more sort of supply chain and, and operations. So as I said, we've got um, 24,500 certificated sites. Uh, it's actually more like 26 because there's a lag in our system of, of, of through certification. And we're in 134 countries. So anyone that thinks we're you know, purely uh, a bunch of British retailers thinking we rule the world, it's not like that. Aside from Brexit, we are global. Uh, you know, we don't know the, uh, the impact that Brexit may or may not have yet on our, on our business. Um, so I've just broken down there in terms of, of where we all are. And of course, food's the biggest standard. It's the most mature. Um, it's, it's very often the first step from a retailer. They can specify things to their, to their suppliers, who are probably the food suppliers. Um, and then that can start to creep back up the supply chain. So this is just the sort of general distribution of, of where our packaging sites are, the packaging certificated sites. So as I said, there's 3,400 of them. Um, so yes, there's a huge weighting towards Europe, um, but what I wanted to do in this slide was explore um, in terms of where we're most popular. So UK is at the top, it's hardly surprising. Um, but interestingly, for a long time, Germany was number two. I think Germany was number two from the outset. I think issue one uh, in 2001, um, Germany's always been second, and suddenly China's there. And the interesting thing, not only is China second in, in, in terms of, of our popularity uh, contest, uh, if you like. It's also in the top 10 growth. It's at the top of the growth. So we're getting 46% growth year on year in China. And if you think about where all our products come from, it makes absolute sense that we're growing there. And it's really um, reassuring, I think, that, um, that the, the sort of factory of our world, if you like, is, is, is actually uh, engaging with standards like this. Important thing to note about the standards as well is that legal compliance is the starting point. So if a company is manufacturing packaging materials in France or Spain, they are subject, obviously, to the um, relevant legislation in Europe. Um, the auditor, when they're going into that site on an annual basis, will be checking that, will be assessing whether they are actually making risk assessments to determine if they are compliant with the legislation. Um, so, by inference, if you've got products coming from a Chinese certificated site, uh, packaging materials or consumer products, they are legal, um, legally compliant in the country of manufacture and the use, where they know the use, because sometimes packaging materials are manufactured to stock. So, good practice then. So, how do you avoid getting uh, migration issues in the press? Any ideas? I've got nothing after this, seriously, nothing. I'm joking. 
Ultimately, it's really simple. It's getting a food manufacturer and a packaging manufacturer in the room together and talking about the product and the likely packaging materials to be used, the supply chain that it's going to be going through. Will it be refrigerated? Will it be heated in the packaging? Will it be um, stored in the Sahara in some you know, brand new warehouse built there for some reason? It's that collaborative effort that's going to identify those critical points because packaging material manufacturers are really good at making packaging and food manufacturers are really good at making food. So by coming together, they can make a, a really good um, assessment of the likely supply chain, of the known supply chain, and determine what packaging material is right. So I said earlier that you know, in terms of um, gas phase migration, where you've got um, the, the, perhaps the carton board, the plastic film, and then the product, so a typical cereal box, um, it's really, I mean, I'm, when that story broke, I think Jordan's, which is a, a huge muesli manufacturer in the UK, they decided as, as, a, as a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, really, that they were going to go just virgin board for all their packaging. And I thought, well, that's great, but we're going to run out of trees at some point. <laughs> so not necessarily a good decision. Actually, if they went to their film manufacturer and said, look, we've got this issue with my, my mineral oils, what have you got that's a barrier for them? Problem solved. Absolutely problem solved. And it's that kind of, okay, story breaks, go back to your packaging material manufacturers and, and, and come up with a solution together. Oh, three minutes. I've got three minutes left. I'm nearly at the end, don't worry. Ultimately, the, the responsibility for legality when it's on the market lies with the packer filler. So it's usually the food um, food uh, manufacturer, because it's them that's putting it on the market, the brand owner, the retailer, it's their responsibility to make sure things comply with the legal requirements. It can't be the packaging manufacturer's responsibility to maintain compliance with legislation because they don't know what food is going to be packed into it. They don't know what migration testing to have done. Um, part of the declaration compliance requirements in the standard say that where testing has been completed, where migration testing has been done, any modelling, um, any, any you know, real-world testing, that should be included in the declaration of compliance to allow people further down the supply chain to make educated uh, calculations as to whether that packaging material is appropriate for its use or not. Um, so it's really, you know, there's an element of there of competitiveness as well. There's, there's all sorts of issues potentially if you've got a, a brand new packaging material, but, you know, it's, it's, it's only sharing information that's going to avoid these sorts of scenarios. Um, so just as a, a quick um, sort of guidance, really, if you're changing a product, go talk to your packaging manufacturer. Um, if you're considering a new product, get everyone in together at the same time, including transit packaging as well. Corrugated board is um, probably around 60% recycled content these days. So, you know, the potential for, um, for, for potential contaminants, contaminants in that material is quite high as well. So it's really crucial to, to evaluate the potential hazards there. And if you're trying to change shelf life or anything like that, as a food manufacturer, you need to be talking to packaging manufacturers. And I realise to the packaging manufacturers in the room, I'm probably singing to the converted, but this is the type of messaging we're trying to convey to food manufacturers who are actually um, so engaged with our, with our standards. So that's me. I don't have any business cards with me because we've just moved offices, so um, apparently we don't have any printers that are that quick. But um, these are my contact details. So if you have any questions about the standards or anything like that and you want to contact me later, please feel free to do so. Any questions? <laughs>